All right, six years of good advice. Let's talk about it. All the things that are, I won't say all the things I've learned in six years of running a business, probably too much to talk about in one podcast episode, but we can talk about the biggest things that I've learned, the things that I wish I had known when I first got started. We like to do episodes like this every time we hit a major milestone with the show. And I feel like six years, it's a good time to talk about it. Before we dive in though, here's a quick word from one of the businesses that sponsors the podcast. We'll be right back soon. Do you ever feel like your payment processor is robbing you blind? For some of us, it's not blind. We look at the amount of money that's going to our payment processor month after month. And a lot of times we ask ourselves, is there a better way? I'm making good money, yet so much of it isn't actually ending up in my pocket. In the world of payment processing, in many cases, it's a cashless world. So you have to have a payment processor you can really trust. I personally am a big fan of Brad Norwood, who's the owner of PrimePaymentsUSA.com. Brad's a business owner himself. He knows all the challenges that come with running a business. More importantly, he knows the value of an individual customer. See, some of these bigger businesses, they're all about scale. They're all about bringing in as many customers as possible. But do they know your name? Do they know your business? Do they know what's important to you? In many cases, the answer is no. And in worst cases, they're just looking to get as much money from every transaction that you work hard for, which really doesn't feel too good. So you got to reach out to Brad Norwood today and understand how he's doing business and why it can save you money month after month. More importantly, you might even ask him about his zero fee payment processing that he's offering to a select few of people. Go to primepaymentsusa.com and start putting the money that you worked hard for back into your pocket. All right, six years in business, six years of running the podcast, six years of good advice, a um, little bit of backstory only because I do run into people who don't know these details about me. Uh, my job is not the podcast. My job is the business I run, Good Advice and Podcastable uh, and Better Rank. And the podcast started as a hobby because I had no customers, didn't know what to do with my days. And a friend said, hey, you should do a podcast. And I thought, okay, why not? So we're six years deep on the show, six years deep on running a podcast. And man, reflecting on a lot of history, a lot's happened in six years. Um, I went from married with no kids to now I have two kids, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, I went through COVID as did all of us. Um, crazy economy, crazy inflation, just a wild, a, a wild world, I guess. Um, a lot of debt I had to pay down, a lot of money that I spent that I wish I could have gotten back. Man, where to start? Where to start? Six years of grinding. And I think what I want to do today, Joy will join me on one of these next episodes coming soon. Um, she'll join me on one of these. We'll talk just like we like to do on episodes like this where we kind of recap and reflect and she gets to share a little bit of her perspective um, as well. All this to say, um, what I wanna do today is I wanna share an honest look at what the journey has been like for me. This journey will not be true for everyone, for some of you, you will have a very easy road to business success. And I want you to know that if that is your story, I'm not jealous or mad or angry. I am hoping and praying that that is your story. That when you set out to start your business, that it just clicks, it just works, and you find deep financial success that you find um, an immense amount of freedom around your time and your interests and all of those things. 
Uh, if that ends up being your story, um, I'm in- incredibly happy for you. I hope that that is the case. For many of us, that won't be the story. For many of us, starting and growing a business will be a true test of resilience, of battling loneliness, of battling a infinite number of setbacks, things that you never expected, being told no far more times than you ever said yes, than someone ever said yes, and getting up day after day, trying to make a meaningful impact, believing deeply in the mission of whatever your business is based on and defined by. This is the journey that many of us will go on, and it will be a true test of your will, of your positivity, and your willingness to innovate what you sell to be more in tune with what your customers really want. And I say that intentionally because I think for many of us, we set out to develop a product or a service. The business owners who make it long-term allow that product that they envision to be shaped and to evolve according to what customers, the feedback they give you versus the business owner who digs their heels in the sand and says, I'm not moving. I'm not changing. If they don't want to buy it, they can go somewhere else. You know, um, I have not seen business owners make it long-term with that attitude, which by the way, that's a different, we're not talking about Someone who's keyed in on who their buyer is, who says, well, that person's not really my buyer. That's a different conversation than someone who is getting feedback that the product stinks and they say, well, you know, it wasn't for you. The product was never for you. But let's recap. And I think we'll probably do maybe a couple of these over the next few weeks. Let's recap a little bit on some of the biggest lessons learned in six years of good advice. First things first, I wish I had spent my money more carefully and I wish I had expected the road to making money to be as long as it truly is. Understand that when you buy, rather when someone buys from you, when someone buys from you, this is not a gut decision that they make. People today are smarter than ever. They're more knowledgeable. They have an infinite number of options of who they can buy their solution from, not just local, but immediate access to a variety of your competitors all over, not just the nation, but the world through a click of a button. So understanding this, the time that it takes for someone to make a buying decision is usually not something made overnight um, unless you are just so lowly priced that they, it's like, how could I say no? Which by the way, is not a great avenue for building a sustainable brand. So understanding that people are going to want to learn about you, they're going to want to interact with you. The sales stat that's thrown around, who knows how true it really is in terms of the number, but the sales stat that's thrown around is that for someone to buy from you, they have to have interacted with your brand at least seven times. This number seven gets thrown around a lot, right? Point being more than once, there's a multitude of interactions that allow someone to do two things. One, build trust with you and not a relationship but they see a piece of content you put out, they have a conversation with you, um, they hear about you from a friend, from another customer. All of these things are instances that build trust with you. So they build trust with you. And second, they reduce the amount of risk they feel about their purchase with you. Both of these things take time to do. So I wish in retrospect, When I started my business, it was day one, and I genuinely expected a full book of business on day one. I was Kevin Cosner in Field of Dreams. I had built the business. I said, the doors are open. And I genuinely believed that people would be calling. I mean, how how wild is this, right? 
I, I almost am embarrassed to say this, but I, I genuinely believed day one, the phone would be ringing off the hook. Emails would be coming in. It's that meme of the talk show guy, the late night talk show guy who's like pulling on the gates, I think of the White House. And he's saying, let me in. Like I very much envisioned people doing this with my brand. And instead, day one, crickets. Nothing. No calls. No emails. My wife didn't know any better than I did. I walked out of my office at the end of my first day. She said, you know, hey, great job. Day one in the books. How'd it go? And I thought, uh, I didn't really do anything. Now, in turn, this is how the podcast got started. I needed some something to divert my energy to. I mean, back in the day, I answered a lot of Reddit threads, people asking questions about business, about management, different things related to running a business. Um, so I answered a lot of these things because I just I was I was chomping at the bit to help, but I didn't have customers to actually help in turn. And the other thing is I wish I had spent my money more carefully. I was um, not as business savvy as I am today. And the way I do business is very earnest and upfront and candid. I try to be very transparent with my process. I try to be very transparent with outcomes. I was on a sales call today where someone was trying to launch a podcast. And I said very candidly, are you prepared to run a podcast for one year? And she said, yes, I am. And I said, because... It's going to take at least a year of you committing yourself to this thing, irrelevant of you hiring me or not, but it's going to take you a year before you see any kind of meaningful outcome from this. Is that something you're willing to do? She said, yeah, I am. I was at another conversation with a local business owner uh, earlier today who she, she couldn't afford my rate. And she said, you know, what would it, what would it cost just to get an hour of your time? And I said, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that would be a good use of either of our times. I don't think I'm good enough to really give you so much value in one hour. I mean, I think I could, but I just don't know how much actionable, like by the time an hour is over, all we're going to have been, been able to do is dig into how much money have you made? What are the bottlenecks? What are the red flags? What are your goals? Where do you want to take the business? And where are you today? Like just getting a sense of the business is going to take an hour. So I don't think that'd be a good investment for you just to pay for an hour. And these things aren't like tricks to try to get people to spend more money. It's being honest and candid. It's, hey, I'm not going to take your money if it's not a good fit for you. I'm not going to ask for the sale if I don't think it's a wise investment for you. And I've had many people over the years who've called me and said, hey, I want to hire you. And about 10 minutes into the conversation, I'm like, I don't think you should hire me. And, and by the way, I don't think you should hire anybody. <laughs> so this is how I do business. Early on, I, I, I just assumed, oh my gosh, I was so naive. I assumed people are honest in what they sell because I had seen like, you know, those shows growing up where someone scams someone else and it's like a big, you know, not a sitcom. Um, what's it called? Not a documentary, but I kind of just thought like if people scam people, it, it, it would get all over the internet. People don't do that. And I very much got scammed with my first investment. And I was so gaslit about this expense that I spent, I spent 5k up front. I spent another 10k by the end of the year. This was all the money I had, basically. And for what few customers I started with, I was directing all of my income from them back to this marketer who was emptying my wallet effectively. I wish I had been less trusting. It's not to assume the worst in people, but I wish I had been more um, wise about how I was spending my money. And then probably the last thing, and this is, I think, probably if you're a small business owner, this might be the most insightful piece of information for you today. I wish I had been more serious and regimented 
about my sales early on. My perception of my brand, even despite, it's so funny how, (coughs) excuse me. It's so funny how you get these signals that really take a while for you to really get it. Maybe I'm just a slow learner, but I very much thought if I build it, they will come. They didn't come. And as the years went on, as time went on, I was doing the podcast. I was showing up on social media and I just, (coughs) excuse me. I assumed that at some point I would not have to sell, that my business would generate so much momentum that people would just come to me. I'd never have to do a sales call again in my life because I was only doing enough sales to keep my business alive. I never put any intentionality behind how to sell more to really ask myself. Who's my customer? What are they buying? What's the price point that they associate with my service? Am I fairly priced? Am I underpriced? Am I overpriced? How do I become a better salesperson? The person who comes to me, who knows me and who has known me for three or four years, that's an easy sale. How do I, how do I sell to the person who we're talking for the first time? These are things that I had to throw myself into really honestly, I'd say around year four of my business when I I felt like I had leveled off, I had plateaued, I was stagnant in my business. Part of this also, I mean, around year four, we were a couple of years after COVID, which was still kind of in COVID. A lot of that was in play, but I was like, this isn't working. I, I really have to get serious about this. Um, that continued into year five and is now sort of cusping out at the start of year six, getting incredibly serious about my sales acumen myself, my expertise, but also making it an intentional piece of my business. I think we sometimes confuse this with marketing, by the way, and I'm not one of those people who, you know, really... (laughs) I've seen content like this that's like, sales is not marketing, it's different. And, and I totally, I agree with that, by the way. I do, I really do. Your, your marketing is not your sales. And I think in that, a lot of times we feel like we're doing a lot in the sales world when we're paying for a company to post on social media for us. We're pulling the marketing levers, but we're not actually in sales conversations. We're not actually putting ourselves in positions to meet our customers and to offer them your product or service. So if that's you, if you're in a position where you feel like you're not making enough money, your revenue isn't as high as you'd like it to be, the answer could be that you're not being intentional enough about your sales process. Here's what I'm talking about. Do you know who your buyer is exactly? And I don't mean these generic comments, which is a lot of times we think we're being specific when we're not. So someone says, these are actual things people have told me. My perfect customer is people who use the internet. That's not your customer. My perfect customer is men and women you know. That's not your customer. Your customer is a very precise demographic about your business. I know that my best customer now understand, by the way, I think sometimes we get really weird about this because it's like, well, if I say who my customer is, it means I can't work with anyone else. That's not true. You might, you might bend out of these, these channels a little bit, but for good advice, I know my perfect customer makes at least a hundred K in revenue. Uh, honestly, they make about a quarter of a million dollars or more but they're usually under a million in revenue. They have up to five employees. They aren't managing a large team and they're thinking about scale. They, they, they can touch about anything they can reach and they want to take the business beyond their personal involvement. 
They need systems. They need a better process for sales. They need an they need intentionality around the brand and the customers that engage with it. If you don't have this nailed down to a T, and furthermore, if you don't know exactly the problem that you solve, you will continuously be frustrated in your sales process. If you don't know the problem, and, and, and understand something for a second, the problem you solve is not your job title. The problem, and, and it's also, it's not like a clever marketing thing. So let's say you're a plumber. The problem you solve is not clogged toilets, but it's also not um, this weird marketing of like, we provide, <laughs> we provide, you know, a transformative experience in your bathroom. Okay. That's weird marketing. That's not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the true pain point someone has is inconvenience in their day, a toilet that does not work. They are looking for candidness around the process for fixing it, and they're looking for clarity around price. So being able to know how to address those pain points, whether it's through your marketing or a sales call or what have you, you're instantly better off than your competition. So start with understanding who is your customer. And then the second step is where do you find them? I think this is a, it's an incredible source of pain for many of us because though we can sometimes visualize who this person is, it's hard to imagine where are they? There's not like a meeting. I can't go to nwanetworking.com and see, you know, <laughs> meeting for doctors over 200K in rent, which I don't serve doctors, but you know there, there aren't meetings like that posted, right? So you have to be clever about it and you have to be willing to test and try some things. Networking has done well for me, but networking may not be for everybody. Test it and try it. Online social media has worked really well for me. LinkedIn has been something I've really enjoyed. I found a lot of guests for my podcast, created a lot of traction on there. That may not be the answer for everyone, but the point is rather than being aimless, I'm just going to show up every day being intentional on here's where I'm going to show up. Here's where I'm going to test and try. That is something you're going to have to do. And then lastly, you have to measure, you have to measure and keep track of your revenue, the percent of conversations that you're closing. These are only the, it's only through doing this that you can have any sort of insight beyond what's anecdotal or a gut feeling. Your gut feeling cannot be trusted. Your gut feeling will be on cloud nine one day and in the throes of despair the next day. You will think you're doing great and then wonder why your bank account is always empty. And similarly, you will be too hard on yourself and then you'll realize, hey, my revenue has tripled in the last 12 months. So having a sense of the data behind your brand is crucial for running a sustainable business. And it's also how you can make good decisions on how to spend your money. Man, there's a lot to unpack in six years. I think the only other thing I'll say is this, and then we'll, maybe we'll keep this, this a part two for this conversation later on. The only other thing I'll say Whatever it looks like, find people who understand the entrepreneurial journey and can share it with you. Having guests on my podcast was an incredible game changer because hearing people's stories, and I've had a number of business owners, many business owners who run million dollar and tens of million dollar brands who've come on the podcast. Hearing their story about how freaking difficult it is and the setbacks and challenges and trauma that come with entrepreneurship. If I hadn't heard those stories, I would have thought that I was deeply broken and I would not, I would not have had the patience to keep going, the perseverance to keep trying. Who's to say what the future brings? This isn't about me. I don't know if I'll be here in six years. I mean, I 
I'll be alive, but I don't know if the brand will still be. I, I don't know what the future is going to bring. But what I will say is I'm proud, of, I'm proud of where we are today. The business has always been about helping other people. It's never been about me. And so I will allow my customers, and I'm going to keep showing up every day, and allow my customers to help shape and guide the business as it is. And every year we'll keep saddling up for this rodeo. So wherever you are, know that you're not, you're not alone, but find people who can be good friends in this journey because people not on the journey won't understand. They won't know how to encourage you, console you, give you honest feedback. They won't know how to help. You need someone in the journey with you. All that to say, thanks for tuning into the podcast today. And yeah, six years of this bad boy. We've been doing this thing for a while now. Uh, if you are a long-term listener to the show, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting the podcast, whether you're on our Patreon or maybe you're a business who sponsors the show. And um, man, a lot's happened. I keep saying that. It's hard to encapsulate six years of the journey in 20 minutes. <laughs> but where I am today, sales is top of mind. That's the thing that has been the game changer for me. So I wish you well today. I wish your business well today. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Make sure you're subscribed and following the podcast. We'll check you later. See ya.